The Unshackled Waves, episode 125. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, as you know, during the lifespan of the Unshackled Ways, we've interviewed many different people, but it's been a while since we've had an international guest on the show, apart from our New Zealand friends. So today we are lucky enough to have on the show American YouTuber Hunter Avalon. He is arguably one of the world's most famous uh, anti-SJW YouTubers, with his channel currently at 385,000 subscribers. His videos have included wrecking ridiculous feminist trends, uh, white privilege, transgender pronouns, and of course the cancerous US mainstream media, especially BuzzFeed. He also has regular recurring segments on his videos, such as Adventures in Retardville and his sitcom The Liberal Kid. He also has uh, regular characters as well, such as Honest Bear and his transgender alter ego Jaclyn. He was one of the first YouTubers who I started to view quite regularly and was a gateway, so to speak, of me coming across all these other entertaining anti-SJW YouTubers. It was his success that partly inspired me to enter the world of alternative media, so I'm certainly excited to meet and chat with him and to discuss his successful YouTube career. Hunter, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. Now, you're one of the first people to get me onto uh, the YouTube culture and uh, partly inspired me to enter the world of online media myself. And you're one of the few YouTubers who I still make an effort to watch. So it's quite an honor to be speaking with you. Thank you. That, that actually means a lot. I know the um, some of the uh, anti-feminist SJW videos aren't as popular as they used to be. So I appreciate the fact that you still watch my content. It means a lot. Now, uh, you're only uh, 21, but you've uh, been active on YouTube for a number of years. Like uh, most uh, YouTubers, you uh, had a humble uh, beginning. You were, uh, I've heard you speak, you were interested in uh, video from a, a young age. So describe how you uh, first started to you know, enter video production and uh, first uh, foray into YouTube. Sure. Well, I mean, I've been doing videos... Um, not for YouTube, just I would make home videos since I was really, really little. Um, probably when I was trying to think how old I was, and maybe been somewhere between 10 or 12 was when I um, wrote up a script to make this little movie um, in my backyard with my dad and my sister in it. Um, so I've been doing videos for a long time, and then it wasn't until uh, I think it was 2012 when me and my brother went and made like a goofy little skit online. Um, and he actually convinced me to do it because at the time I hated myself on camera. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that the videos I made growing up, I was hardly ever in them because I was, I hated my face on camera. I hated my voice. So I was always like the behind the scenes guy. Um, so he convinced me to go and make a video on YouTube, which I did. And it got some like hundred views, only like a hundred views. Um, and at the time I thought that was so many. So that started up a little YouTube channel, which I did with my siblings for a little while. Um, that channel didn't really go anywhere. It only got like a thousand subscribers and they weren't really into it. I was far more into it than they were. Um, so I was like, you know what? It's fine. Like this just isn't working out. It, you know, it wasn't like we were mad at each other or anything. I just decided it wasn't working out. So I broke off and created the channel that you watch now, Hunter Avalon. And um, when I first began though, I, I made very cheesy videos. I actually started off trying to be like a quirky, cute, sort of like you, relatable YouTube boy, like all that cringy shit. Um, and so that obviously didn't really work out. And then it wasn't until about close to a year later of just being on YouTube and not really, what didn't really go anywhere, just kind of being on YouTube. I had like some 2,000 to 3,000 subscribers um, was when I got into the more political side of things and found out how much I really enjoyed being in controversy and things like that. And that's kind of when I decided to trash the whole let's be quirky and relatable kind of content and just go head into the politics because that's what I truly was into. I found myself itching to get through the uh, the quirky videos just so I could get back to my next controversial one. And I was like, why am I even making this content? I'm with, I just want to be making controversial stuff. Like I have so much to say on these these real issues like feminism and things like that. So that's kind of how that started. 
Uh, those early videos, uh, I recall off the top of my head, there's ones, the problems with guys, the problems of girls, and then there's uh, one, stupid uh, pictures uh, on online. Uh, so that was actually my first, the stupid pictures online was um, the first official video I made for the channel. Before I would have just a couple like little vlogs on there or whatever. Um, but yeah, Stupid Pictures Online was my first video, and I had bought a green screen, I had the camera, I had everything set up, and I was like, this is going to be my first real video. So, that's a good memory, dude. Yeah, and uh, probably the, the reason why you had limited success is because there's millions of people uh, doing those uh, types of videos. But uh, when mm -hmm. you started doing the political videos, it's when uh, I think, or I certainly was, everyone else was alarmed about, you know, the SJWs, you know, taking over, you know, American university uh, campuses and, you know, people were looking for, uh, you know, a real uh, antidote uh, to it. Did... Uh, is that what made you change direction? Like you observed the same thing, obviously it was happening in America, so you were seeing it uh, firsthand. Well, I was homeschooled, so I actually didn't witness any of it firsthand with my own eyes. I mean, I have some of it now, just going to women's marches and things like that. Um, what really happened was my brother actually told me about feminists. He was like, have you heard about these like feminists that are really like, terrible and they were saying something about he told me some story about some video he watched of some woman saying um that we should uh take men's uh semen and then castrate them or something and i was just like so appalled by this and um i th at the time i would also watch a lot of uh youtuber called undoomed um he doesn't really make content as much anymore i don't really watch his stuff that often anymore um and he would always do feminist like wrecked videos and things like that and I just loved them. I remember just I would watch them and I'd just stay up late in my living room watching them and I would always like have this like a little bit of anger. I would definitely feel some anger and some frustration but also just like this burning like mode. I don't really know the word but it just felt like a burning feeling inside of me like I wanted to just like go after these people like I wanted to fight back a little bit. Um, because it, it just it kind of pissed me off watching like the, all the stupid feminist arguments and things like that. So that's kind of what really got me into the whole feminist side of things. And then I made my video, um, Eight Reasons I Hate Feminism. And what's funny actually is I was unaware that this like feminist hating wave was like about to take off. So like I just made this video because I truly did not like feminism and I truly was like passionate about this and I was like this is a perfect controversial thing. I just – this is exactly what I want to talk about. Like I remember being so excited to make that video. Um, and then yeah, like that's kind of – I dropped that video right as the like hating feminism, like feminist wrecked videos were really picking up. So – I just kind of rode that wave, and that's why the first year – well, I made that video at late 2015, and then 2016 was really when my channel just started blowing up. I was gaining like 30,000 subscribers every month, and then I had my um, Why I Hate Fat Acceptance video I released in August – or actually it was the end of June of 2016. And then that video, I don't really know what happened with that video. It just completely blew up. It has uh, over 2 million views now, and over that month alone, I think I gained some – 60,000 more subscribers. So that's kind of when like 2016 was when the the uh, bashing feminism was at its all-time peak. So all of my feminist videos, I didn't realize real like I guess I didn't realize that genre was so huge because all my videos I would do on feminism were just like blowing up and I was just like, "Oh good, like my videos are getting views. This is nice." Um I mean, at the time still like 100,000 views were was a pretty big big milestone. Now I mean that's that's pretty much my average for videos. So it definitely was really cool getting started, though. Uh, and so, obviously, your uh, main commentary now is on those uh, political issues. Did, did you have firm political views before uh, you started your channel in that direction? Or have you sort of, you know, as on your YouTube journey, you've en entered the, the political sphere? Um, a little bit of both, probably. I know that um, – so my grandparents are very, very conservative. They're uh, what you'd consider Tea Party conservative, which is actually a – they're not – don't get me wrong. They're nowhere like alt-right or something like that. I want to make sure that you know I don't say something wrong about them because they're great people. Um, they're just a little bit more traditional conservative, I'd say, than I would be. Um, so, you know, even some of their conservative opinions, sometimes, like, I'm like, guys, it seems a little extreme. Like, they, they for example, thought that um, 
Obama was really out to like destroy America. Whereas I thought like, look, I don't think his methods are working, but like, I don't really believe that he's trying to, he's actively trying to actually ruin the country necessarily. Just some things like that. But for the most part, um, they're really awesome people. They're very smart. And they would always talk about politics. They were super into politics and they would talk to me about politics also when I was younger even. And you know, I was a little younger. I didn't really care that much. Uh, a lot of it, I was just kind of like, that sounds scary. I just kind of would rather just ignore it and not worry about it. Um, so yeah, like I honestly don't really know exactly how that happened. I just know that I definitely started, it was actually back when I did my YouTube channel with my um, siblings, some of my later videos were talking about like um, sort of mocking political correctness. It wasn't quite as, as honed in as it in as it is now. I didn't really understand everything going on the same way I do now. So it was a little bit of both. You know, I definitely had some political, um, like not well, not really knowledge, but I was had been around politics before. And then yeah, as I got on YouTube and expressed opinions that I already had felt passionate about and already felt that I had you know factual information to back me up, my um, opinions and things did start to widen. So I'd say it was just a little bit of both. Your channel at the moment has uh, over 385,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, now, mm. despite being yeah, very famous on YouTube now, I can tell from chatting with you uh, so far that you're still quite uh, humble. Um, so uh, That's but, first. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so what, uh, when you saw, like, obviously, you talked about when you got up to 30,000 and that, what did it feel like that, you know, obviously you saw the subscribers go up, the, the comments, uh, go up as well and also your other social media like you would have got you know heaps of you know friend requests and that what uh, what, what, what was the sort of feeling like when it's like you know wow I'm you know gaining such a large following I mean it was honestly I'm not gonna lie like it was super exciting um, because even when I was younger and I would make these videos with my siblings I always wanted to do YouTube for my job and I always wanted to go viral like my big thing was like I want a million views that would be so cool and so to actually see my channel blowing up, like I was actually able to, um, when my fat acceptance video was blowing up the way it was, I would be able to log into like a live count and just watch my subscribers just like tick up. Like, I think I, I went to bed and woke up and I gained like, maybe it was like 10,000 more or so. Like it was, in, it was an insane amount of growth. I, I gained, when the, when the video first started blowing up, I think I gained 11,000 subscribers in the first day, which is, I mean, that's uh, still, still even now, that would be enormous. And so it was very, very exciting. You know, it was, it was really cool to see that, um, to see that finally happen. And yeah, since it had kind of been like a dream of mine when I was little, that really made it like really special too, because I was like, this is something that I, I hoped for and dreamed of when I was young and now it's actually happening. And it's really cool. I was like, I actually can look back at my channel with, now I have several videos with, you know, over a million views now. And that's just, that was really, really cool. So it, it was definitely an, an amazing experience. I, I haven't been able to get a hit that big sense, actually. Um, my channel's more just kind of like steadily growing. You know, it has its low points. There's a few months that go by where subscribers are really low, and it's probably stuff to do with like school or something, or maybe just I didn't make as much content that particular month. But yeah, for the most part, I mean, now my channel just kind of is at a, like a steady growth. It's not really at like a massive blowing up all the time kind of point. So, yeah. And obviously... I, uh being famous on YouTube, it's not quite the same as uh, being a movie star, but it, it gets no. you a lot of uh, you know recognition. Would you say that uh, you know the fame has changed you at all? Um, I think at times, it, I mean, I will say all my videos, like I, I call myself like a narcissist or whatever. Um, I do have a bit of a bit of arrogance and a bit of narcissism about myself. That's kind of just who I am, and I just kind of accept it and, and roll with it. Um, I think in a way, it it may have changed me in a sense that um, I'm a little bit more confident now about like my opinions and things like that because then maybe if I have like a little bit of a um, controversial opinion, I know that I have a audience of hundreds of thousands of people that will most likely agree with me or maybe have already agreed with me if I've already mentioned it in a video. So I think that in a way it's given me more confidence, which might not be the best approach to take on things. I mean, I have confidence in myself and in my ideas regardless of a YouTube audience. Um, I think if anything, it's just helped me be even more confident, I'd say, because I was confident in my ideas and my beliefs far before I had any YouTube recognition at all. Um, so, I mean, has it changed me? I mean, that might be kind of a big word. I think that part of it's just, I'm just, like, I'm growing up in real life and I'm maturing. 
and it's being shown. That's obvious on YouTube. Like my older videos, I came off a lot more um, pretentious and a lot more angry. Whereas now, uh, my videos are a lot more focused on, you know, continuing to debunk like liberal bullshit with, you know, facts and logic. But I also pride myself in like being able to drop a few good disses and some roasts. And um, I, I try a lot harder now to be entertaining while also being factual. I don't not so angry and like pissed off at everything. I still get heated and angry at with over some topics when I think it's necessary. But I think more of it's just I've matured and I'm growing as a person and that's kind of um manifesting itself on YouTube as well. I don't necessarily think YouTube has changed me so to speak. Obviously, with getting a lot of recognition on YouTube, you become the target of those uh, response videos. And the actual way that I came across your videos was not through uh, your video directly, but through uh, Jacqueline Glenn's uh, triggered response video to the truth about transgenders. And uh, mm -hmm. given how hysterical she was uh, uh, in that video, I was like, well, if she if she's reacting like this, I've got to check this guy out. Uh, so how do you, like, because there's quite a few response videos to you now but how do you sort of handle you know that that sort of um uh you know critique of yourself um you know most of the time if, if one goes up depending on like you know who posts it i'll click it and sometimes i watch the whole thing other times i'm just like okay this is like just someone just roasting me or whatever like i whatever um i don't really take them that seriously because um and let me make sure i word this correctly most response videos come from channels that are uh, very small and not that just if you know if you have a smaller subscriber base that I don't think that by any means means your uh, opinion is not valid I hate people that try to say that like oh I'm right because I have more followers or something that's just stupid and petty um, but a lot of the times I don't always take them that seriously just because they hold no real impact on me whereas you know someone like Jacqueline Glenn who has uh, more subscribers than me to see her do a response video that I know I'm like I'm gonna get some heat from this this is gonna be some drama um, most of the time though I don't mind like it does you know uh, it is exciting and I don't you know I, I like the drama I don't mind it like I said I, I kind of run towards confrontation um, so a response video for the most part is is not a bad thing for me all publicity is good publicity so if someone's gonna go hate on me and, and post a response video like Jack and Glenn um, you know, I'll watch it or do what I did in, in her case, which was make a response video that was, you know, far better and completely destroy her invalid arguments, which is exactly what I did. Um, it's funny, actually, that you bring that up, though, because me and Jacqueline, although we still have somewhat of our disagreements, we actually get along somewhat, um, somewhat nowadays. So, yeah, but for the most part, I mean, her response video was pretty, pretty stupid. She, uh, I haven't watched too many of the, uh, videos, but she's she's kind of a mixed bag on a lot of the the issues. Some some she's really good uh, good on like you know saying that there's only like two genders, but other times you know she you know goes down the you know uh, liberal uh, path. Yeah, and I think you know I think that's the case with a lot of these um, anti SJW YouTubers. A lot of them think like I think a lot of people tend to think that these people roasting social justice warriors or feminists um, are conservative um, or at least, you know, a little bit on the right. And for the most part, that's actually not true. A, a large amount of people bashing SJWs are still pretty liberal. And although, you know, their SJW videos are okay, it's like that liberal side of them still shows, which isn't always a bad thing. You know, I'm open to new ideas and opinions. Um, but you know, it's usually like the negative traits of liberalism that kind of like f that shines through every now and then. Um, there's one YouTuber you probably know who Shuan Head is. Um, she's she's cool. Me and her used to have beef years ago. It's it's me and her are kind of friends now, but she's sort of sort of like that. Whereas like you know her videos are SJW are uh, debunking SJWs, but not so much lately. But at least I know back a few years ago when we were in our beef. It was like her liberal side was so obvious and so apparent that I was like, you're really not that much better than a liberal because it's just like, yeah, maybe you hate feminism or maybe you hate SJWs, but it's like aside from that, you're you're just a liberal and like you act like a liberal, like a hysterical liberal. You know, I don't I want to make sure that I'm not just going to call everyone that disagrees with me a liberal or something like that. Like she actually behaved as you'd kind of expect an SJW liberal to act at the time. And like I said, you know, things have gotten a little better. Me and her are friends, but... I think she's a good example of that. 
And one of the comparisons you have got on YouTube is that you're the right wing version uh, of Anision. Ugh. I I hate that comparison. <laughs> Um, I think people think that because we both are kind of assholes online. And I mean, I, I am an asshole. Like I, I know that I don't really give it like, I don't give a fuck. That's kind of who I am. Um, I think that like people can compare me all day long and I'm not going to let it get to me or bother me, but Onision, that's, that's a big stretch now. Like honestly, my older content was more like Onision because, uh, fun fact, <laughs> Oni I used to, so trying to think how to word this several years ago um 2015 right before i kind of got on to my making more a little bit more like edgy content um i would actually watch onision this is before i found out that he was like a liberal fuck um and so i would watch him and he actually is kind of who inspired me to get into this edgy humor and some of the stuff like i i just loved his videos they were so edgy and like they had a lot of cursing but they were funny and like um some of my old, old videos, again, before they were like full political, but they were definitely like going down the, the more edgy path, um, have some humor that's actually quite similar to Onision. And so that I, it's understandable as to why some people may have seen those videos and then compare me to the, the right wing Onision. Nowadays, though, you know, that was I used to get compared to Onision a lot more when I was first starting because um, even like our voices or the way that we like talk sort of sounds a little bit similar, I guess. I have actually not been compared to Onision now in quite a while, which has been nice because I, I hated getting compared to him because I don't like Onision any longer. Um, so yeah, late, lately though, I, have, I haven't really seen, I've seen that pop up once or twice. It, it was a lot more um, apparent when my videos were first starting and my persona online was slightly different. Like I said, I've matured a bit since I, I first got on YouTube. I'm actually going to throw another uh, comparison to you. Uh, f uh, one of the ones that I came up with is you're kind of like the political version of Nash Greer. I'm not sure how you f feel about that. So Nash Greer is, well, he, I mean, he's like completely irrelevant now. But um, I actually used to, I hated Nash Greer when I first started on YouTube. I hated Nash Greer. I hated all those like Viner boys because... I oh like I always saw them for what they were. They were just like talentless hacks. Like, I mean, how lame would that be to be getting famous off the fact that you look good? It's like, oh yeah, I have millions of followers online because I have blue eyes. It's like so lame. It's like you didn't do anything to earn that. You know what I mean? Like, sure, Nash Greer has more subscribers than me now, but I'm much happier knowing I have 385,000 subscribers, most of which I hope subscribe to me because. They like my content. They like my opinions. They actually like the substance of my videos, not just that I'm some cute-looking J. Crew boy or whatever. Like that, just I, yeah, I, I have never really liked uh, Nash Greer or any of those Viner boys. I've always thought they were just extremely talentless. Uh, that is a funny comparison. Well, it probably has played a uh, played a part the the fangirl factor uh, in your success. You know, it's funny. A lot of people. Assume that more my, that my uh, most of my viewers are girls, but it's actually the opposite. Um, according to like YouTube audience or whatever, like m the majority of my demographic, not majority, that's not true. Um, I think it's like 60, 40, something like that. Um, there are more males that subscribe to me because I think polit uh, politics wise, just generally speaking, I, maybe more men are into that than women. I don't really know. I mean, I have a fair share of, of female fans, but the people that follow me are not all a bunch of like, um, like teenage fangirls. Actually, the the largest um, bracket for age is uh, 18 through 24 year olds, which is just the just the mark I'm trying to hit because they're people my age that I can really relate to. And now you have uh, uh, obviously before you were successful on YouTube yourself, you followed a number of uh, YouTubers. Uh, you mentioned Paul Joseph Watson, the amazing uh, atheist. Uh, have you been able to, uh, you know, mingle with like a lot of the you know people who inspired you? Um, trying to think. So, like for example, Undoomed. Actually, I got to talk to him on a stream. Um, it was very brief, but it was really cool because I was like, dude, like you're the one that inspired me to get started on YouTube, which is kind of funny now because um, my channel is a lot larger than his now, um, which is kind of kind of funny. Uh, I haven't got a chance to talk to Paul Joseph Watson. Before I was banned from Twitter, he actually followed me. So there was some connection there. Like he, he must have noticed me enough. Um, I am 
hopefully going to be able to talk to Milo soon, Milo Yiannopoulos. I, I'm a really big uh, big fan of his. He's one of my main inspirations. Now, he uh, like follows me on, on Instagram, which is, is really cool. Like, I, I was really happy to see, to see that. Um, as far as the Amazing Atheist, who goes by TJ Kirk now, uh, he doesn't like me, actually, at all. So I kind of just quit being a fan of his, and I was like, well... I saw I, he would go on these um, podcasts and like be they would all like be bashing my videos or um, he would mention me on like a, a video he was I forget what he even said it was it was something kind of like stupid or right? it didn't really bother me but I was more just like okay like I guess you don't like me which whatever you know not not everyone's required to like me but I did not get a chance to ever talk to him nor do I really care to any longer now because you know he obviously wants nothing to do with me. Uh, and, and it's funny uh, following YouTube culture. There's you know the, these conflicts that you know go on between famous YouTubers. It's like a you know mini you know <laughs> Access Hollywood episode. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now um, you've uh, been looking at going into uh, other uh, media projects. You were uh, on uh, this uh, web podcast Trigger Talk for a while, and then uh, you started a new one, uh, Offended uh, America. So where do you see your uh, YouTube and media career going? Um, well, I'm in. The, you know, it's very briefly in the works right now. It's more of like an idea. Uh, the, those last two podcasts unfortunately didn't work out. The, the Trigger Talk one was fun. Uh, that was a guy with a guy named Dylan. He um, owns a, a really large Instagram page, Too Savage for Democrats. Um, that one, like, it, it was fun when it lasted, but it just kind of fell through. And then Offended America, I started it on my own, and then I started working with some other people, and they they were good people. Don't get me wrong, but their their vision for the podcast was very different than mine. They, I you know, I like things to be. Um, edgy to have like a, a bite to them. I'm I'm so sick and tired of this soft and like boring, predictable humor nowadays. I like jokes that are kind of like get a reaction that catch you off guard. That you're like, I didn't see that coming, or like, can, did he really just say that? Like, that's the kind of humor that I find funny. And they they didn't they weren't really into that. So, offended America still exists. I'm just no longer a part of it. It's um with a different with different people now. So it's whatever. So I I am, uh thinking hard about starting um, a new podcast. This time it'd be like a legit one that I would stick with. Um, and so I would probably be having a new podcast up on um, a place called Podbean. It's where you can upload podcasts and things like that. What I'm trying to do is um, a lot of my fans want me to have everything on YouTube, but what I'm trying to explain to people is I don't want to be restricted to YouTube only. I want to be on, I want to cross platform, which is, you know, like if YouTube goes down one day, I want to be able to have, you know, an audience on this site also. You know, I want to be able to, to maintain popularity without just YouTube or without just one platform. So probably going to have a podcast starting up in the next, you know, few weeks or months. Um, and then a, a big project, uh, you may have seen my liberal kids skits that I do. They're very cheesy, but a lot of people find them very funny. Um, again, mostly just an idea. I have a lot of big ideas that I really have to get started on because they, they just take time. But um, pro hopefully going to have a... Um, liberal kids season that I'm going to release, which will not be anything like the YouTube skits. Cause you know, with me wearing a wig and screeching about how triggered I am is funny for like a minute or two. But if you're trying to make 20 minute episodes, um, that get old and boring really quick. So I'm actually trying to write up the pilot right now of, of an actual real episode of the liberal kid. I would play the liberal and, um, the general, like I haven't told really many people about this, but the general premise is, um, you know, I think that I'm better than everyone else because, you know, liberals often do. They think they're, like, morally superior, but I'm just wrong about everything. And so that's kind of what's going to make it funny is I have, like, this air of arrogance about me, and I just think I'm so not racist and all these things, but I'm actually just, like, the biggest fuckhead. So it's going to be – I mean, if it if it comes out the way I'm thinking, it'll be hilarious. It'll be edgy and, like, really – I'm hoping that it can bring back some edge to some of the, some entertainment because – that's a big thing of, of mine that I, I really do get hung up on is I really, really hate soft and lame, predictable, like just PG humor. I like there to be some edge to things. So those are kind of my big, big things in the works right now. And of course, just, you know, continuing YouTube, releasing more content, um, just continuing to grow my channel mostly. 
Yeah, that, uh, that sitcom, uh, or spinning it off into a fully-fledged sitcom, that sounds uh, very ambitious. I, d I do like the, 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 the liberal kid. I mean, I, I like, you know, when YouTubers do, you know, caricatures of their, um, you know, uh, p uh, political adversities. Um, I want to turn to uh, now, obviously, you're the first uh, international uh, guest I've had on the show for a while, and so you're living in uh, Trump's America. Now, you mentioned that you came from a sort of traditional Republican family, and of course Trump is not a you know, traditional Republican uh, president. Mm -hmm. So, what got you on on board the Trump train? Because it was a bit difficult for a lot of Republicans. Yeah, you know, um, that's kind of a hard question. I don't know if it was just like one thing specifically. I know that. Um, so the way the way I was raised anyway was my my family is Christian. I I am no longer a Christian. Um, but I know that you know I was I was so young when Obama was elected. I really was too young to understand a lot of politics, or I just didn't really care that much. All I really remember of that is just my parents didn't want Obama to win, um, and then I know they told me he won. Like I just went to sleep. Like I just went to bed, and they told me the next morning who won. Um, so when it came to Trump, you know, when the when the first like um, election started like rolling out, um, I really liked Cruz, and this was actually before Trump was even in the race. Um, and, you know, I don't really know what exactly got me on the Trump train. I just remember just hearing him talk and just, like, seeing him, like, part of what I like about Trump, I'll be honest, um, was I see a bit of myself in him. I see someone who isn't afraid to just say it how it is and isn't afraid to just, um, you know, go and just, like, risk being in the midst of ridicule or controversy and things like that. Now, of course, you know, I'm not saying that I am anything like Donald Trump. What he's doing is far more extreme and, and you know, much bigger things than, I, 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 than I've done. Um, but I, I feel like I might, I'm – part of the reason I liked him was because I could identify a little bit with him and his personality and things like that. And then also, when it, you know, when it came to his policies, I, like – I just agreed with them. I liked them. They made sense. Not everything he said – was like this polished politician, um, and I don't really know if this is all the reasons why I liked him then, but I know this is, you know, I can look back and think of it now. It was just, yeah, he, he didn't come off like a polished politician. He just said things. It's like, people are coming in our country illegally. Let's put up a wall so they can't come in. Great. Like, that just makes sense to, to the average American. Um, and, yeah, I, I also liked, you know, the way he um, comes off as very, like, alpha. He's very, like, dominant. He's just, like... He's like a man, you know what I mean? And that does sound a little gay, but <laughs> I can appreciate that when it comes to a, a leader and stuff. And it was, it feels like, you know, we have someone in office now that actually has balls. I feel like when Obama was in office, he was just like, he was just like a wimp. He was soft. He was a pushover and things like that. Now we have someone that's like, not going to bow down to political correctness and isn't going to just, you know, br br bend and break and break their back for, for what the left wants and things like that. And it's, you know, I am very, very happy with Trump. You know, I, it's like, see, having Trump as president, it makes me proud to be an American. It really does. And I know some people are going to laugh at me and accuse me of just being like a Trump fanboy or whatever. And whatever. I don't really care what people say because I, I really do support Donald Trump. I supported him then. Uh, and I do support him now, even with the controversial things that have happened in the past. Oh, most of that, I mean, if you, we get, you know, CNN uh, in Australia, if you watch that, it, you know, his presidency is a, a total disaster. Like, uh, my, you know, honest assessment is, you know, things are looking pretty good, but obviously the, the big one is, you know, the wall, you know, hasn't been built, let alone, you know, funded yet. I think that's the thing that he's got to, you know, do to think, you know, this is, you know, what, I, what I've achieved in office. Well, he has um, an excellent plan. I actually uh, talked about this on my uh, last video I just posted yesterday. Um, you know, what Trump's done right now is he has not only backed the Democrats into a corner, but he has basically exposed – it just exposed them. And so that's probably another reason why the Democrats are so mad. So, um, you know, I don't – I know you're not in America, so um, you probably don't keep up with that many American politics. Um but what what um what he did is he introduced a a bill that said he'll grant uh, legal citizenship over the course of I think it was ten to twelve years to um 1.8 million illegals, including you know DACA members, which that's actually uh, under Obama it was only like six hundred thousand. So again, Trump is being far more generous to immigrants, and in return, 
he's, he receives billions of dollars to build the border wall. So if the Democrats say no, they've completely betrayed the dreamers, which they apparently love you know, more than American citizens, what I said in my last video. Um, but if they say yes, well, they've saved the dreamers, but now Trump gets the wall. So they are, they're, they're basically trapped. You know, no matter what they choose, they're going to look like fools. And I think that was an excellent, excellent move on Trump. I know some conservatives felt like Trump was betraying his base by granting uh, citizenship to, to people. But I think he's doing what you have to do. you got to negotiate. And now the Democrats are showing just how hysterical they are because they won't – they're not coming to an agreement. They're, they're just – you know, it's like you can accuse Trump of being racist all day long. He's trying to give legal citizenship to more people than your lord and savior Obama, yet you're not, you're not accepting it. So the Democrats are really the ones looking like losers now, and it's, it is thanks to Trump. And he would like to do implement a lot more of his uh, agenda, Trump. But, you know, he's been, uh, even though the Republicans have the House and the Senate, he's been sabotaged by his own side. I mean, it only takes, you know, two Republican senators to, uh, you know, vote down, you know, his uh, legislation. That's why we still have uh, Obamacare, for example, which is, you know, he, you know, can't help that. Yeah, well, a lot of these Republicans are, again, they're just, they're soft and they're losers. And, um, they're very, very like traditional, you know, they're more along the lines of like, a president shouldn't talk this way. It's like, I don't give a fuck how someone talks. I care what they're going to do. So, you know, a lot of that can go back to just being more traditional, I think. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, we both enjoyed the, the left's meltdown after uh, when Trump got elected, uh, the, the mass uh, triggering, uh, as, as I call it. Uh, one year on, it seems to be that the left you know, hasn't learned anything. I mean, they still had their women's march where they were, you know, blaming Trump for uh, everything, even even the, you know, uh, Me Too movement, which was actually created by, you know, liberal Hollywood men. So it just seems mm -hmm. like they're still, and, you know, you can throw the media in as well. They're, you know, they're still their same, you know, triggered, hysterical, irrational selves. Exactly. And you'd think they'd be like, you, you'd think if they had, you know, two brain cells to rub together, they, they'd think to themselves like, okay, we lost the election. Maybe calling all white men privileged and saying they have toxic masculinity and everyone's just a racist, homophobic bigot isn't the best approach to win, to win net future elections. But rather than learning, they've, I mean, honestly, you say they continued in their hysteria. Part of me thinks they may have ramped it up even more. You know, it's like they're getting worse. It's like I just feel like the, you learn something from the election, but they haven't learned anything. And, they're just, you know, they're just going to – they can keep doing it. Like I don't really care because all they're doing is just giving Trump a second term. I mean they are – it's like um, I was listening to a Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos the other day, and he said it well. It's just it is now uncool to be a liberal. It's just lame. The major like – I mean, as far as SJWs and safe spaces go, even when it comes to like mainstream stuff, that's mostly made fun of, you know? So like, it is uncool now to be a leftist. And, you know, they can continue behaving that way and all they're doing is digging the hole deeper. And uh, now, uh, a lot of the time, uh, Americans are accused of being uh, American-centric, but you've actually done videos on, you know, international incidents such uh, such as the the Barcelona attack. What do you see as the concerning trends uh, in the overall Western world? Well, I think what what a big um, big problem is in a lot of the the liberal Western world is this overwhelming desire to be tolerant that's now put above everything. It's like if a, if a Muslim goes in and blows someone up, we don't have to be tolerant of that guy. Like you don't have to make excuses. You don't have to act like an apologist. And I think a lot of it is, listen, there's nothing wrong with being tolerant, okay? I think that we should be tolerant. Like this country is tolerant. You can come to this country and you can openly be gay. You can openly be transgender. I mean, you can openly be, you know, 600 pounds. And you'll be accepted and everyone will celebrate you or whatever. But there comes to a point where it's like if – I said it in a past video. If tolerance – what is it? If you get to the point that you have to ignore facts in order to be tolerant, uh, you're no longer being tolerant. You're just being stupid. So it's like if you have to ignore or try to put, you know, look the other way to facts, like there are more than two genders or whatever, 
then you're, you're past the point of tolerance. You're just being a retard. So there is a bit of a line there. And I think what's happening is liberals are so obsessed with being tolerant, the very thought of, you know, having the balls to actually stand up for something or saying something's wrong, they're terrified. They're afraid they're not going to be tolerant. And then you get to a point now it's like, okay, we're supposed to tolerate feminism and we're supposed to – all this kind of thing. But then we're also supposed to tolerate Islam or we're supposed to tolerate gays, but then we're supposed to tolerate Islam. So then it's like a paradox because then you're supposed to tolerate uh, two things, but they can't really exist together. So it just gets to be messy. And that's why I think lib I think that's probably – that one of the biggest problems right now is like tolerance is not everything. It's okay to say that Islam isn't always good. It's okay to say things like that. And um, I think, yeah, I think that would probably be a, a big, big problem right now in the liberal Western world. And, and tolerance doesn't mean, you know, you have to, you know, respect, you know, how someone lives, for example, like, yeah, they can, you know, like, identify as you know non-binary or whatever but you know i have the mm. right to think that you know that's ridiculous and you know call it stupid there seems to be and and this is why you know leftism liberalism is so to totalitarian it is because it's you know you not just have to you know allow them to you know live you have to you know basically you know accept it and you know be nice about it exactly and you're no you're exactly right because yeah, tolerance, I mean, tolerance really just means just let people live how they want and just leave them alone. You know, sometimes I wish that the liberals would tolerate me. Just leave me alone. <laughs> like, just stop dragging me into your bullshit. And so I definitely, no, you're, you're actually exactly correct. And that's the problem is liberals are, they think if you don't go out and celebrate everyone who's transgender or you don't go out and just worship and bow down to every person of color or every gay person, then you must hate them. It's like two extremes, you know? It's like just if I don't worship someone doesn't mean that I despise them. Maybe it just means that I just don't really care. Just go live your life. Live and let be. You know what I mean? Li uh, live and let live. Sorry. <laughs> Now, I wanted to talk about a, a bit about your uh, family background because uh, a lot of people, you uh, a child, uh, come from a family of uh, six children. You were, you know, homeschooled. So, uh, most people would say you come from a like, like, traditional, you know, Christian American uh, family. So I'm curious mm -hmm. to know what was, you know, that experience uh, like. Though you're not actually from the, the Bible, as it's termed, the Bible about of America, you're actually in uh, Maryland, which is actually a more liberal state. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, liberal, uh, excuse me, Maryland is a more liberal state. Um, I don't really mind living in Maryland, to be honest. Um, it's not liberal like California. It's more just kind of like it's just a blue state and it's sort of like whatever. Um, as far as like my upbringing, you know, it was good. My parents were great and, you know, they actually, they still um, are very supportive of, you know, what I do and things like that. Um, Obviously, you know, they're they're Christian, so they aren't particularly thrilled uh, about me, you know, kind of becoming an atheist and things like that. Um, but, they're, you know, we, we're still on great terms and things like that. As far as my upbringing went, um, you know, it wasn't anything personal against my mom or my parents or anything like that. But I am a much more uh, extroverted person, so homeschooling probably wasn't the best thing for me. And looking back now, if I had the option, you know, to like redo it, I definitely would have – uh, preferred probably to go to school. But then at the same time, you know, I look back and then I wonder if maybe had I gone to school, uh, the liberal ideology would have gotten to me. And so, you know, it's a little bit of both. Like, I, I think that I probably would have benefited from being around people more. Um, homeschooling, I, I really didn't didn't like it very much. I mean, it works fine for some people, just it didn't really, wasn't the greatest fit for me. Um, but yeah, looking back, I do think that it probably protected me from the liberal uh, ideology kind of like getting into me. Um, so now, you know, I, I still – don't get me wrong. I still, you know, know what liberals believe. I, I try to look into, uh, you know, other opinions and things like that. I, I don't want people to think that I just live in a little echo chamber where I'm only surrounded by like Breitbart and Fox News and things like that. I mean I, uh, I follow all sorts of things. But for the most part, I mean my upbringing was good. It's just I'm not sure how much I, uh, I enjoyed being homeschooled, I guess. As, uh, and I want to talk about uh... – you know, like, obviously, it was quite public on YouTube, you leaving, uh, you know, Christianity, and it's it's a big deal to, um, 
you know, you know, like obviously, you know, it's something you've been raised with to, you know, go from, you know, one worldview to another. Uh, you know, why did you want to you know, uh, feel that, you know, that's what you needed to do? Well, it's because um, there were the, excuse me, there were a lot of factors that played into it, a lot of which were just kind of like with my own personal life and things like that. Um, part of it's kind of like, so this is a little personal, but I did bring it up in a video, so it's, it's fine to mention on a podcast. Um, I have uh, OCD, which is like an anxiety disorder. Um, and, you know, my first uh, experience with OCD, which at the time I was, I was too young. I didn't, I didn't really understand that it was OCD, but my first experience with just like severe anxiety, uh, was religious OCD or religious anxiety, things like, um, I mean, I would go through phases that I would, I would, I was like a 12, uh, 13 year old kid dealing with anxiety so bad that like, I just wanted to go to sleep. I remember thinking like, if I just go to sleep, then at least I'll just have some relief from this. And that anxiety was all about, like, am I going to go to hell when I die or things like that. So that already kind of puts a bad taste in my mouth about religion. And I know that religion isn't to blame for that. You know, don't get me wrong. I, do, I know that uh, being religious does not mean you're going to have OCD or something like that. Uh, what it really comes down to now, though, is that I hate control and I see uh, Christianity uh, is so similar to liberal ideology in a way, like where – you say you don't agree with a liberal, they tell you you're racist. You say you don't agree with a Christian, they say you're going to hell. And it's kind of like it's – there's a lot of like similar traits to it. And what it really comes down to is I hate control. I hate being told that I can't do this because it's not in the Bible or I can't do this because God won't like it or I can't do this because God said this or God said that. And it's the same thing now with liberalism. I hate being told that I can't think this way because it's – you know, racist or not accepting or something like that. So a lot of like my leaving Christianity um, had to do with the same reasons that I am so adamantly against liberalism. And that is just that I, I hate control, especially like I understand there are forms of like authority. Like I, I don't hate authority, you know, like I respect, you know, our military police and things like that. Um, it's more like unnecessary control, which I really, really hate. Um, I mean, even if you think about it, like with liberalism, there's a lot of like thought police, you know, like you can't think this way. And it's kind of like that way in Christianity in a way too. Like you, you have a sinful thought. You can't think about that. You can't think about this. I mean, when I was much younger, I would um, have doubts about my faith and that would just cause me to have anxiety all over again. And like, I'd felt guilty for thinking that and things like that. So it's just kind of like, I see a lot of the things I dislike about liberalism in Christianity as well. I'm old enough to remember, because uh, I grew up in the, the 2000s, when it was, yeah, Christians who were, you know, uh, acting as the, the, the snowflakes and, you know, getting offended uh, by yeah. things. Oh, yeah. that, and it's gotten better in in recent years, because they're, uh, they're realising now, you know, their freedom is being, you know, threatened by these uh, liberal, you know, t t totalitarians. But, yeah, it's mm -hmm. definitely, um, yeah, based on uh, what you're saying, that it's still, you know... Uh, a degree of that problem in Christianity. Yeah, and honestly, like, even though I myself am not a Christian, and I have had some pretty bad experience with, uh, experiences with Christians, especially online and some in person, they're just, I, again, I know not all Christians are like this. I want to make that very clear, because my family isn't like this. Um, but a, a lot of Christians are, are just little triggered bitches, just like SJWs. You know, you say one thing that goes that isn't christian they freak out and they get all triggered and offended and things like that and i just it, it's not that much different so you are you are correct in that sense um and then when it comes to the whole like should a christian bakery be forced to bake a cake um you know although i am not a christian i still believe that they that private businesses have rights and I mean, is it stupid to deny baking a cake because someone's gay? Yeah, I honestly think that's kind of dumb. Even when I was still a Christian, I thought to myself, I'm like, I, I mean, the Bible talks about Jesus uh, washing the feet of his disciples or uh, what was the one story? Jesus went and spent time with sinners or things like that. So Christians believe gay people are sinners. Uh, wouldn't it make more sense to bake them the cake? Because then you're do you're acting – there's a thing in Christianity called sanctification, and although you know I don't believe this, I was raised Christian, so I know a lot about Christianity. Sanctification is um, the idea of trying to become more like Jesus, and so 
Christian, a big goal of Christians is to be, you know, sanctified or whatever. Start, I don't really know the, the way to use that word properly, but sanctification. So wouldn't it make more sense to actually bake the cake? Because then you're, you're acting like Jesus. You're being more like Jesus. You're serving the sinners. You're washing the feet of the sinners. So again, I don't think being gay is a sin. I think that it's just like let people do whatever they want um, so long as it's legal and consensual. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the whole thing like not baking a cake kind of doesn't make sense even within Christianity. But I still think that businesses, you know, deserve um, deserve rights. Even like even when I got banned from Twitter, you know, was it stupid? Yeah, is is Jack like a, a fuckhead? He's the guy who runs Twitter. Absolutely. But you know, they are a private company. They have the right to ban me, and it might not be fair. It isn't fair, but they still have that right to do that. So, you know, I, I just think that they do deserve rights. I just. I think private businesses deserve rights. I just think it'd be stupid to deny the cake to begin with. Well, Hunter, I've appreciated you uh, opening up to uh, me. It's It's been an enjoyable chat, and obviously keep up with the, the videos. I, As I mentioned, I still take time to, to watch them. You obviously have a bright future ahead of you, and yeah, once again, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thanks so much for having me on, man. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Our next event is nearly upon us. That is Protect Victoria's Rally, calling on the state government to take stronger action on the state's African youth gang crime wave. It is on Sunday the 11th of February at 1pm on the steps of Victoria's Parliament. So if you're concerned about this issue, then please make your way to Melbourne to show your support. Also, the Unshackled will be present at the Free Speech Rally, hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be also held in Melbourne. It is back now at the State Library of Victoria on Saturday the 24th of February at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness, so I hope many of you can make it. If there isn't enough happening, uh, also another reminder that our friend Dave Pillell from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018, on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.